Thank you all for taking the time to vote for our next content. It seems orcs are the most treasured Xenos faction. If you aren't subscribed and you'd like to be a part of these polls, make sure you hit that sub button so you're alerted when we're voting. Let's get into the video. There exist enemies of the Imperium whose actions earn them the ire of our species. There are enemies whose very nature is reason alone to eradicate every trace of their existence from the worlds their kind inhabit. There are those enemies who continue to eke out a tired and loathsome existence as if merely to spite us. Then there are those with whom so much hatred has been bred, so much blood has been spilt, and who have taken from us so much that their intended extermination is an overpowering compulsion bred into every subsequent generation of humankind. And so will we never stop, not until every last greenskin has been put to the sword, their empires shattered, leaders beheaded, and their crude edifices demolished. The ground they dwelt upon will be purified in holy flame. Only then can we give pause to rejoice in the defeat of that particular foe. Even as our blessed Imperium rejoices at the news of a second son of the Emperor, Lionel Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels, once again taking the fight to the foulest enemies of mankind, we must maintain our vigil over what united territory remains of man's galactic empire. Should the Xenos, ever opportunistic in their approach, elect to seize their moment and once again besiege the worlds our people have sacrificed so much to maintain. Since time immemorial, mankind has suffered at the hands of the Xenos. Their capricious nature, as alien to our civilization as their physiology, crafted as we are in the Emperor's image. They look upon the holdings of the blessed Imperium with the gaze of greedy thief or the savage conqueror. Verdant agri-worlds capable of feeding entire fleets of invaders, whilst our populace rarely fare better than the produce they grow in that situation. Many an eager Xenos raider having no qualm in butchering human beings to keep their stomachs full. Our planets of industry provide apt targets for those who would seek to expand their armaments at the expense of the Imperium of Man. Yet still there are Xenos hordes who butcher raid and pillage simply for fun. Their entire cultural mindset is intent on only the raising of strong armies and the waging of war. Of course, we speak of the orcs, often thought of as simple creatures, whilst true to a degree, the threat they pose to the human species in its totality cannot be overlooked. For this race of raiders and warmongers alike, has been responsible for annihilating a first founding chapter completely, threatening the very cradle world of humanity itself, and exhibiting a racial memory which spans millennia and bores a particular hatred for humanity. The number of our enemies grow ever still, yet for all the danger which the blind fools who serve the ruinous powers bring to bear against us, there are numberless hordes of feral Xenos in the form of the Orc Menace whose presence within the galaxy almost seems a natural measure to keep in check any other species which may grow to become too powerful or far-reaching. The existence of the orc race has been known to humankind for longer than accurate records exist, first contact even predating the formal founding of the Imperium itself, though our earliest records have long since been lost to the ravages of time and the flames of civil upheaval. What is known for sure though, is that this menace has proven itself to be the greatest Xenos threat to the Imperium of Man, save perhaps until recently with the arrival of the Tyranid Hive Fleets. A billion times more numerous than the galaxy's worth of humankind, it has long been theorised by many that were this fractious, warlike species ever to be united under one banner, then the fate of all would be sealed. Of course, the truth of Orc nature, that might is right, has proven to be its downfall since the days of the Great Crusade some 10 millennia ago. The powerful space marines, lightning quick in their precision strikes, have become accustomed to toppling orc empires or warbands by assassinating their leadership. 
One well-placed strike can lead to the downfall of an orc war, numbering in the millions. Yet now, within the era Indomitus, when humankind is beset on all sides by its enemies, old and new, the most terrifying thing has occurred. The orc species are on the verge of being united by one leader. To better understand ways in which to combat a foe, one must first understand it. Some within our hallowed Imperium would decry this as heresy, though in times such as these, a lack of prudence or apprehension of the fragility of mankind's empire could very well lead to many more heresies besides. It could easily be said that some of mankind's greatest wars have been waged against these beasts. Conflicts which shaped humanity's destiny while simultaneously cementing its galactic dominance. For what better anvil to forge our own superiority upon than test it against a race who knows only a life of constant battle? It was indeed the Emperor himself who first proved that the mightiest of Orc empires could be toppled when, during the Great Crusade, he led a force of millions into the heart of the Ulanor system, intent on avenging himself against Orc warlord Erlak Erg. When demigods trod the same battlefields as mortals, and entire Xenos races were expunged from existence, a victory against these savages was still not a certainty. It was then loyal, mighty Horus, prior to his appointment as War Master, who would dispatch the Orc leader personally, using his legion's tried and true spear tip manoeuvre, thus cutting the head from the body and removing all sense of unity and leadership from the system spanning Orc armies. Doubtless, if Horus and his legion were not able to reach Erlak Erg himself, then the mighty host the Emperor had mustered would surely have been ground to blood and bone dust beneath the boot of that oppressive Orc horde. Of course, not long following this greatest of victories, we know the civil war that was the Horus heresy would tear the Imperium asunder, pitching brother against brother, burning millions of innocents in the flames of a galaxy-spanning war through which inconceivable atrocities were committed, though never did the threat of the greenskin fade completely, having cemented itself in the memoirs and annals of every Space Marine Legion. The victories against it recorded not only on parchment, but stitched into chapter and company banners, their very culture forever standing in opposition to mankind's pursuit to build a civilised galaxy. Lost to myth, the Emperor's sons would disappear one by one, as his imperial truth was all but subsumed by the fanaticism that was the imperial creed, and mankind would come to be ruled by mere mortals whose affairs were trivial and self-indulgent in comparison to the Emperor's aspirations. It was during this time in mid-M32 that great calamities would befall humankind, though heroes would be forged and oaths of loyalty tested beyond the point of breaking. Upon that thrice damned planet called Ulanor, the resting place of so many loyal soldiers of the Imperium, through the sheer passage of time, or perhaps the confusion created by galaxy-spanning bureaucracy, the cunning orc species once again would rise to claim that planet, and indeed the system of the same name, for their own. Sadly for our beloved Imperium, we weren't to know of this gathering storm until the fated day the Sons of Dawn would be eradicated. All of this cruelty and malice devised by a powerful orc warlord known simply as the Beast. So colossal was this orc that its visage and stature was said to harken back to an ancient time eons ago, when entire species were crafted by powerful beings to do battle against gods. Either way, what is surely known is that the beast was unlike any orc encountered before, its wit sharp and its cunning utterly alien in its belligerence. As if paying for the success and honour earned by their gene father, in his stalwart defence of the Segmentum Solar millennia past, the entire Imperial Fist chapter, save for one captain, Corland, would perish over the course of only two skirmishes against the organised, well-drilled Orc hordes unleashed by the Orc warlord known as the Beast. It was recognised that the largest, most well-organised of these Orc clansmen were adorned in dark armour offset by a chequered pattern. Upon closer inspection, it was realised this armour was in fact the salvaged power armour of the legionaries belonging to none other than the ancient turncoat Lunar Wolves. The beasts' armies had overthrown their imperial conquerors, 
salvaged the remnants of ancient battles across that system, and clad themselves in the armour of their most hated of foes from the time of the Emperor's Great Crusade, millennia prior. Although this bleak period of history known retrospectively as the War of the Beast is best discussed in a separate addendum to this work, it must be known that during that conflict, the Orc race would rise above any preconceived notion of their tactical acumen or engineering comprehension. Organised elite Space Marine formations were repeatedly bested by the savage foot soldiers of an Orc culture, which had diverged into separate clans and had then been united under one Warlord's banner. Not only would the Beast achieve this feat of unification, perhaps a bastardization of the Emperor's own victories culminating on Ulanor Prime, its forces had sallied forth throughout the galaxy in a green tide of destruction, enslaving entire systems and laying low all who stood before them. Needless to say, the forces of our beloved Imperium would endure and eventually topple the Beast Tyrant, though this terrible war against the Greenskins saw several innovations and adaptations for survival made by humanity such as the formation of the Death Watch Brotherhood, the first and only occurrence of the Last War Protocol being announced, and the first and only time a Space Marine has been named Lord Commander of the Imperium. In the case of the latter, Captain Corland, being elevated to Chapter Master of the Imperial Fists, would assume command of the Imperium at large following the indecisive, ineffective leadership of the High Lords of Terror. Unbeknownst to all outside of the most senior adepts of the Mechanicus, the anti-gravitic teleportation technology the Beast armies had utilised in its attacks against the Imperium would be adapted for their own ends and the planet of Ulanor itself, completely relocated to Segmentum Solar against the wishes and beyond the general knowledge of the broader Imperium. It is unknown why the Orc menace returns repeatedly to Ulanor itself Perhaps the defeats they have sustained as a race are so ingrained in their psyche that its recapture is written throughout their very gene code. Or perhaps one can ponder as to whether the orc species' persistence for conquering Ulanor may be due to this planet holding some significance within their original creation or evolution. Either way, it matters not. If all of our enemies wish to gather into one location, the better for us, in that it is more straightforward to slay the wretched filth. Since its relocation, Ulanor would be renamed inconspicuously instead to Armageddon, though no servant of the Imperium would dare have dreamt the nightmare war zone this planetoid would devolve into, the planet destined to earn its new name in the millennia to come. Throughout the many thousands of years of war between our two peoples, the rivers of gore spilled into the soil of that planet must surely be enough to ensure the crust of that world is stained red permanently. But if before this was so, oceans of blood were soon to be released in comparison. This would be so due to the preeminent rise of a singularly cunning orc by the name of Gazkul Mag Urak Thraka. In the greatest orcs of the past, particularly in the case of the beast, a savage intellect marked the character of such beings. In Gazkul, this trait, his skill in combat, as well as supposed favour by the orc deities, would ensure that orc mobs from one end of the galaxy to the other would flock to him, either to fight under his banner, or otherwise in an attempt to challenge Gazkul for leadership, as well as his coveted title as prophet of Gork and Mork, the twin orc gods. With the coming of Gazkul and his green tide of invaders, a great many Space Marine chapter and Astra Militarum regiment have fought to deny the Orcs their coveted planet's return. Most Hive cities found themselves hurriedly fortified, everyday administratum buildings or places of business being seized by Imperial armed forces for military needs and their outer reaches of approach mined or riddled with tank traps, all in an effort to deny the Xenos scum easy approach to the population centres of Armageddon. Many a hero was born in the flames of the wars which took place on that fated planet, names which ring in history, whose epic deeds know little equal. Beings such as Commissar Sebastian Yarrick, Chapter Master Tushan of the Salamanders, High Marshal Helbrecht of the Black Templars, and Captain Tycho 
of the Blood Angels. Upon Armageddon, in the effort to stem the tide of millions of orcs gathering around Gazgul's cause, tens of Space Marine chapters, as well as Titan households, would assemble in defiance, as did the dauntless, numberless hosts of Imperial Guardsmen, standing ready to sell their lives for the protection of Armageddon's people, and the sanctity of Imperial holdings in the name of the Holy God Emperor. From the fire wastes of the north to the hive of hell's reach in the south, made particularly infamous for the battle of the same name, and the Equatorian jungle band in between, the relentless physiology of orc kind ensured every region upon Armageddon would feel the brutish, wanton destruction of that race. To combat threats such as this within such treacherous environs, the finest of the Astra Militarum have been deployed to make the most of their specialisations. Katachan orc hunters lurk within the equatorial jungle, conducting sorties to compete with each other, who can kill the most orcs, or best the most savage of their kind in combat with their Katachan blades, proving they are not prey, but rather the hunter. Whilst mechanised brigades of Armageddon Steel Legion deploy en masse within the armoured hulls of Chimera transports, their trademark Armageddon pattern rebreathers and chemical resistant trench coats marking them as particularly stalwart combatants in their own right. Indeed it seems where Gazkul travels, wars of epic proportions blossom, an environment where orcs are known to thrive if not thoroughly enjoy. There are those within the Imperial Court who believe the great green beast known as Gazkul has been beaten soundly by our forces not only at the great industrial world of Armageddon, but also recently at the battle zone within Octaria, and then by the wolf lord Ragnar Blackmane himself at the Battle of Krongar. To those individuals I pity their senseless musings. More than ever now, the persistent threat of orc wars is greater than they have ever been due to the efforts of Gazkul to unite his race under his banner. What's worse, and perhaps the issue which is most pressing for our commanders in the field, is that traditional tactics for dealing with orc hordes do not have as great effect against this particular warlord. Unlike other orc warlords who fight until the bitter end, almost mindless in their fury to get to grips with the foe, the tactical mind of Gazkul is sharp indeed. If this foe identifies he will not be victorious during an engagement, he will withdraw to recoup his strength, sure to return having learnt more effective means by which to eradicate his foe. Though it could easily be said that Gazkul's armies, more or less consisting of considerable portion of the orc race, have suffered several losses of late, they have done so both with the knowledge that their casualties are more easily replaceable than our own, and that the war zones they have engaged Imperial forces within have been left crippled, whilst Gazkul has merely suffered a bloody nose in comparison. Whilst the Lord Gilliman marshals resistance throughout the Imperium, we can only hope he has composed a plan to deal with this Xenos threat once and for all. If you've watched this far into the video, thank you very much. I'd like to open up a little on my thoughts as to the narrative that Games Workshop has taken for orcs in recent lore. Whilst it feels the wider community can treat orcs as a bit of a meme or as comedic relief, it does feel that the recent lore and direction Games Workshop has taken the orcs in, namely Gazkul's exploits, are returning more of that threatening, foreboding feel to this faction, which in my opinion they've been missing for some years. Whilst we all love a good cockney green skin yelling torrents of abuse, this is 40k and it's supposed to be grim dark. Honestly, after listening to the Yarrick audiobook which tells the story of his childhood during an orc invasion of his planet, Games Workshop could stand to take a bit of that terror inducing storyline and sprinkle it liberally throughout the orc faction in the current setting. Humans locked in cages like livestock to be fed to the boys or transported as slaves really helps to revitalise the threatening aspects of the orcs again. The fact alone that orcs have no qualms with eating people is not much explored within the lore, and we could probably stand to see a few more stories with orcs biting off heads or even people's fighting hands during battles. I must say though, I do really like the newer orc models we've seen released, especially the more primal beast snagger boys, though I'm not sure I could paint that much green whilst maintaining my sanity. What do you think though? Do you like them as they are? Or do you believe orcs could stand to be a bit more grim dark than they do seem to be recently? And controversially, do you think Gazkul still deserves to lead the orcs in battle? 
or has his time come and he needs to hand the reins over to somebody new? Make sure you let me know your thoughts in the comments. We've been having a great time chatting in the comments section recently and I really enjoy learning you guys' thoughts on 40k lore. If you'd like to support the channel, a subscribe and like does wonders for the video within the YouTube algorithm and we also have a link to Gap Games in our description of the video for those within Australia and New Zealand for models at a 21% discount. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Take it easy and have a good one.